<laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you about uh, today about protein-protein interactions, modeling protein-protein interactions, and give you a historical background, a little bit of how it all started. And oh, I cannot, I cannot move my slides. I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, maybe you can try sharing uh, only this, this. Ah, yeah, okay, uh, okay. Now it's okay. No, now I see. Okay, very good. I have to use, I have to use this. So I'm going to tell you about protein-protein interactions. And uh, this is a, a topic that is, you know, uh, is, is, is uh, of interest for many, many, many years, as you saw by the uh, introduction of, of Christina, it started a long time ago. And uh, uh, we were studying nearly for 40 years protein, about protein-protein interactions at the molecular level. That's how it started. We're studying complexes, the formation of complexes and the structures of complexes and learning a lot about these structures and a lot about uh, the uh, uh, physical the, the, the physical forces or the physical factors that underlie uh, a number of properties of these structures, including stability, affinity, and so on, and, and, and how the interfaces look like. And that, you know, that's the molecular level, but we have in, the, in more recent years, we have studied a lot, we have started to look into the protein interactions at the cellular level, and uh, understanding uh, protein, more protein interaction networks and trying to see how the proteome is organized. Yet many, many questions remain unanswered about affinities, what, what determines protein affinities, protein-protein protein, protein interaction affinities, how these interactions are regulated, and, you know, more specifically, you know, uh, how specific are these interactions, you know, in, 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 in a cellular environment or how promiscuous they may be. I'm, in my talk today, I'm going to focus more on the molecular level, just to give you a historical background and how, you know, the molecular level analysis has evolved in time. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my, my, the plan of the talk is going to be uh, uh, as presented here. I'm going to talk about protein-protein docking, the early days, the birth of docking, when we studied trypsin BPTI, the trypsin trypsin inhibitor interactions, and the reaction pathway of the allosteric transition in hemoglobin. The second part of the talk will be about uh, how what 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 is happening in protein-protein interactions and protein modeling today. And this will be about Capri, and we'll talk about the progress and the remaining challenges. So protein-protein interactions, the early days, I need to mention a number of people that really influenced what was happening then and influenced in particular what I was doing. So I started my, my career uh, as a uh, PhD student of Cyrus Leventhal. Cyrus Leventhal is known for his folding paradox. So he was a big biophysicist that was, you know, really thinking about protein folding, about many, many other things. And uh, uh, we were actually doing my, my PhD studies, we're not really thinking or, or working on, on, on protein, protein docking, but very, very soon after I finished, I stayed one year, you know, over as a postdoctoral fellow with him. And that's when, when the protein, protein docking and modeling started. Then I moved back to Europe from the US. I was at Columbia University with Cyrus Leventhal. And I moved back after I finished my PhD, I moved back to, to Europe. And I hooked up with Joël Janin at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And he, was a, he is a, a, a remarkable person who has insight into protein-protein interactions, protein folding, enzymology, and I started to continue to work with him or started to work with him more on the docking problem. And at the same time, I was, you know, I was also uh, uh, being uh, participating in workshops that took place at the CICAM, which was in Paris then. CICAM is the Centre Européen pour le Calcul Atomique et Moléculaire. And that was very important for starting the whole field of, of molecular dynamics, actually, 
and, and, and protein you know, structure bio, bioinformatics. And Michael Levitt was part of these workshops. We were, we were meeting in these workshops for three weeks from all over the world to try to understand or try to simulate uh, protein dynamics and protein folding. And I was the only one who decided it was too complicated for me because, you know, they, they only did molecular dynamics simulations for like two picoseconds. And I thought that was a bit, <laughs> a bit small. And uh, I was trying to develop my docking programs at the time in, in these workshops. So what were we doing in, at Columbia University? What you saw, what uh, 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 Christina showed you a little bit, the setup at Columbia University was really unique at the time, absolutely unique. And uh, uh, we had one of the biggest computers, the, an IBM 36091 on campus. And in the laboratory of Cyrus Leventhal, we had this, you know, computer hardware that was just the graphics. And the graphics was really stupid. It couldn't do any calculations. We had to have all the, we had to look at the molecule, at the molecules on the graphics and, you know, uh, send requests to calculate energies or to do all kinds of other things. But any numerical analysis was done on this huge computer. And as you see on the bottom of the slide, you see how many tape, tape readers you had. It was a huge room. And the computers were very, very slow. So this was during my PhD thesis from 1969 to 1974. And that's when we started to develop these analysis of, of, of molecules, you know, with the graphics and how to represent molecules on graphics. And there was actually the very first uh, very, very first, sorry, very first uh, uh, computer graphic program that was developed in Cyrus Leventhal's lab laboratory. There was one other computer graphics program that was also aimed at really studying protein folding that was developed in, uh, in Princeton by uh, 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 Bob Langridge. So there were, it's really a pioneering times and the technology was very, very different. Actually, on the slide that you see here on the left-hand side, how we took pictures, we had to take pictures from real cameras on, on tripods, develop them on films, and then, you know, put them on real slides and show them. So this was a completely different, different setup and different tools that we have today. So how, how, how did this whole docking start? So when I came back to, to Paris, I, you know, in, in the laboratory of Cyrus Leventhal, we, we did all these graphic analyses of, of smaller proteins and then uh, we we thought i mean i thought it would be really interesting to study protein protein interactions and you know this is how the docking idea started so what is docking what is protein protein docking it's to derive the atomic model of the protein assembly here you know i schematically showed a pro two proteins you know that, that should kind of interact the receptor and the ligand protein and uh, those, you know, the, the docking applied only to, uh, to, 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 to systems where the individual components actually were stable on their own and uh, uh, they could then form a complex. And the docking uh, idea was to derive the atomic model of a protein assembly from the knowledge or from the coordinates, with the three dimensional coordinates of the components. And this is what is shown on the, on the, on the right-hand side. And so the docking was actually to generate many possible uh, interaction modes between the ligand and the receptor. And finally, you know, zero in on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the one, one mode of interactions or, or several modes of interactions that were likely to be stable. So as I said before, it applies to systems where the individual components exist in the free form. So docking is a, uh, a, a two component uh, procedure. It has two components and the two components, each of them has, has, is, is challenging. So the first component is to efficiently sample rigid body degrees of freedom of the different uh, proteins to, that, that, that are supposed to interact. And uh, also to sample the alternative conformations of the interacting proteins, because you know, when two proteins interact, you don't, you know, you don't only vary 
rigid degrees of freedom, but you also have to, you know, adapt the conformation so that the, the fit between the, 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 the two proteins is optimal. So you need to sample both the three-dimensional, you know, the, the conformational degrees of freedom and the rigid body ones. And that's one thing you have to sample and you have to sample efficiently. And in addition, sampling is not enough. You have to really be able to identify the stable association modes from a very large assembly or very large as ensemble of, of docking solutions. Because you, toss, you test millions of solutions and then you, know, you need to find out which ones are likely to be stable. So you need a robust and reliable scoring, scoring scheme or energy function to, uh, to do that. So what did we do, you know, after I finished my PhD, we started to work on an interesting problem at the University, uh, Columbia University with Cyrus Leventhal and, and, and other colleagues. Namely, we wanted to build the fiber of the sickle cell hemoglobin. So the fiber of sickle cell hemoglobin is a long fiber where the uh, individual molecules of hemoglobin kind of interact and form a super helix. So we needed some coordinate system to try to model these things. And this is the coordinate system that, that, that Cyrus Leventhal and his, his, his team developed. It's a, on the, on the right-hand side of the, I don't know if you see my, 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 uh, uh, my uh, uh, cursor, but on the right-hand side, oh, sorry, on the left-hand side, you see two, you know, two uh, 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 spheres. And these two, each sphere represents uh, one of the components that are supposed to interact. Protein one is sphere one, protein two is sphere two. And uh, we derived, a, we used a polar coordinate system to determine the orientation of the two proteins relative to each other. So, you know, theta one and phi one are two angles, Euler and angles, that determine how, 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 how sphere one is oriented relative to sphere two. And theta two and phi two are the Euler and angles on the second, on, on, on molecule two, on sphere two, that will position the center of mass of molecule one relative to the surface of uh, the second molecule. So these are like four degrees of freedom. And then you have a spin, the sky angle, that kind of turns along the uh, uh, center, the, 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 along the line that joins the two centers, O1 and O2. And you have a spin that orients again the molecule one relative to the surface of molecule two, and then you have the distance between the two centers, center of masses. And once you orient, you can check, you can change the different orientations, theta one, phi one, theta two, phi two, and xi. And for each of these, you, would, you, you can optimize the interaction in one dimension, which is the center to center line. So this was the system we were using, but then, you know, this is the sampling. And uh, computers were extremely slow by the, at, at the time. So we needed to be very smart about how to represent the molecules. So we decided at the time, this was actually my decision after we worked with uh, uh, Cyrus Leventhal, to represent uh, the, um, the protein in a very simplified way. One interaction center per residue. And this was, we were actually very lucky because Levitt in 1976 just published his his, 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 his uh, 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 representation, his simplified representation of proteins for his protein folding, you know, simulation. So this was something that I immediately picked up and we decided to just use that. So one center per amino acid. And uh, then we needed, uh, uh, we needed an attractive force and we needed something that would prevent clashes. So we used a non-bonded term, it just repulsive non-bonded term that, that really was, uh, uh, was allowing us to, uh, to monitor the clashes. And the attractive term was just a solvation energy, which was a very simple solvation energy form. It's a pairwise, you know, the solvation energy was expressed as a pairwise function, a pairwise sigmoidal functions between residue I and residue J. So the total energy to evaluate the interactions was the sum of these two terms. So this is what we did. And we decided, again, the computers were so slow that we couldn't really do a full, a full search of all the orientations of one protein relative to the next. And 
just about that time, in the PDB, there was an interesting complex that was formed, that was studied. It was the structure of trypsin bound to the uh, inhibitor, to the bovine pancreatic trypsin inhibitor, BPTI. So we decided we're going to apply this docking algorithm to study how the BPTI will fit into just the active site of trypsin. We didn't want to search other parts of trypsin. We just said we will take a cone around the active site of trypsin and we will turn and, 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 and test all the possible orientations of BPTI relative to that uh, active site. So this is what we did. And at each, each position, at each optimal position that we generated, we measured the buried surface area. And the buried surface area is something very important uh, uh, to, actually we, we, we measured the energy function that, that, we, that, that I showed you before, where the, the attractive term was actually the buried surface area. And uh, we plotted the buried surface area as a function of all the different uh, uh, positions that we tested. And you see on the right hand side, you see a histogram. And it's the very first time where you, see, this is kind of an energy landscape of all the possible interactions of BPTI with this active site. And what did we see? We saw that the native, the native pose, in the native pose position, which is here shown N in red, is actually has, has the highest buried surface area. And actually, in principle, the more buried surface you have, the more energetically favorable the interaction is. But we didn't only get one good, uh, uh, one reasonably stable uh, interaction pose, but we got also interaction pose I, uh, I1, kind of we called it an intermediate one and intermediate two. And, and lo and behold, we realized that this intermediates correspond to a region which has more or less the same curvature as the part of the uh, native uh, uh, interface of BPTI and actually actually fits into the, uh, into the uh, active site of trypsin as well. And then we had another other uh, places on the BPTI, which is kind of an oblong molecule that also fits. So here we saw that actually the energy landscape of this interaction is very interesting because it doesn't have only one possibility that could, could be stable, but the other possibilities, maybe the other poses could be stable as well. So that was the first time that this was observed. Later on, we uh, thought we were not very happy with this energy, with this solvation energy function. And uh, uh, we uh, decided, we worked with Joel Janin at the time to, to derive a very, more elegant way of expressing the, uh, of, of computing the buried surface area or even accessible surface area in a pairwise fashion. And this was a, a kind of a prob probabilistic approach that computed, you know, the surface area buried uh, of any atom or any, at the time it was a re per residue, but based on the pairwise interaction of this residue. And this is very, very different from the normal surface area calculations where you, you, know, you have to include the whole system. It's not a pairwise function. So this was really a, 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 a step forward. And for the solvation energy, we used uh, uh, a, a term that, is, uh, that multiplies a, a sum factor times the buried surface area attempt or times the accessible surface area. And this really interesting factor was 20, in, in other words, you pay a penalty every time you have one angstrom squared accessible to, a, to the solvent, you pay a penalty of 25 calories. And this is what really drives the uh, association. One of the factors that drive the association between two proteins is how much you can desolvate, uh, how much area you can desolvate. And this is really, we, we, do, we owe this, uh, first of all, the surface area calculations were derived by Richards and Lee, BK Lee and Richards, it's Lee and Richards algorithm. And the factor that, 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 that really links the surface area to the hydrophobic effect, which is this factor gamma, 25 calories of penalty uh, to a, a one angstrom squared. This we, 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 we owe this to Chosia and all these three people 
I interacted with really closely at the time and they were really fantastic to, to, to work with. So uh, one other thing that we did using these, uh, uh, using these uh, docking algorithms immediately uh, just after, in, you know, a few years afterwards was about the conformational change, about the reaction pathways for the quaternary structure change in hemoglobin. And uh, well, hemoglobin is the mother of all allosteric proteins. And upon oxygen binding, it undergoes a, 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 a reasonably small conformational change uh, in terms of the rigid body orientations of uh, the alpha beta uh, dimers. So hemoglobin is a tetramer, as you may, you may know. And uh, we have a dimer of a dimer, a dimer of alpha beta uh, uh, dimers. And upon oxygen formation, it turns a little bit and it changes also the conformation uh, uh, internally. So you have two conformations. You have, in, when, you know, in, in, uh, in, when, when you have oxygen bound, there is the R three-dimensional conformation. And when the oxygen is not bound, you have the T conformation. And the T and R conformations really form a different quaternary structure, which is shown on the right-hand side. So we, what, what was interesting at the time, people were trying to see or trying to understand how the quaternary change is linked or is associated with the tertiary change upon oxygen binding. And this is, in other words, what was the transition state between these two conformations, the R conformation and the T conformation. So we used our docking algorithms, we imposed twofold symmetry on the, on the system. So we had we reduced the number of degrees of freedom that we had, we had to follow. We just had four degrees of freedom instead of six. And we, we, we uh, sampled a wide range of dimer-dimer orientation starting from the R conformational state or from the T conformational state. And at each position that we generated, we optimized buried surface area only while minimizing clashes. So what we found out at the end is that when we took the conformational state, the T state, uh, we uh, could move towards the R quaternary state very, very long. Actually, we could reach the R quaternary state using the T conformation. But when we started from the R conformation, we could not change, we could not move towards the T conformation. We, 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 we lost surface area interactions between the dimers in the R conformation. So what we do that is, you know, the transition state for this change must be very R-like and not T-like. And this was this very, 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 uh, uh, very simple model. And we published, we tried to publish it, we couldn't publish it anywhere. No one believed us and said, it's only calculations. You cannot do anything with this. We have to have experimental proof, proof. So we finally ended up publishing it in biopolymers. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, then, you know, about, that was in 19, 1985 when, when we published it. And about uh, uh, several years, six years later, a very interesting PNAS paper came out by William Eaton, who is a very famous biophysicist at the NIH, who was an expert of, of, of hemoglobin. And he studied the actually transition state for the R to T quaternary conformation. And he tried to, you know, tried to, to, to derive this transition state based on, 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 on data on the, uh, on the rates of, of state on, on, the, on the transition, on the Free on, on the free energy on measurements, actually on measurements on the free energy of uh, uh, of the the uh, uh, transition state. So he devoted the whole paper on on this analysis. But he said he finally he said that a previous theoretical study, which was our study using a highly simplified energy function, suggests that the R-like transition state is the result of the reaction pathway with the maximum buried surface area. And that was exactly what he was finding based on, on, on comparison of the activation and equilibrium enthalpy and energy between, you know, the, uh, uh, from, from, from experimental studies. 
So this was fantastic that, you know, even six years later that what we, we found based on very simple models was actually correct or actually reasonable. Now, that was the historical part. So now I'm uh, going to bring you through a little bit about where we are today. So protein, protein docking, where are we at? Since, you know, the, the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, docking has become a routine modeling tool. It has evolved to include template-based modeling approaches, and it is supported by a vibrant community of methods developers, and it's stimulated by Capri, and this, uh, this is what I'm going to show you. So we started actually, you know, this is how the docking started. We needed to do docking. The community of people who were developing methods needed to know the structure, the dimensional structure of the individual components, exactly in the unbound structure or the bound structure. They started actually from the bound structures and wanted to find again how they interacted. And then if it started from the unbound structures, you know, you needed this, this structure of the unbound component and using these two structures, you were using doc, you were applying docking algorithm to generate the model. This then evolved to, uh, as more and more structures were available in the PDB, you didn't need to know the unbound structure to really do something. You need, all you needed to know, you needed to have a homologue to the bound structure. So you were given a, to, as a modeler, you, you could start to model the complex if, you know, just having sequence information. You have sequence information for protein A, sequence information for protein B, and uh, uh, then, you know, you looked for homologs in the PDB and you did sequence alignment, you found the homologs and, you know, these are the templates from the PDB and then you docked, you, you, you built your, your own structure based on the template from, from the sequence, that, from the actual sequence of, of, the, of the protein you wanted and you did the docking. So this was, you know, the next step and even more later is, also not only templates were available for the individual proteins, but when templates started to be available for complexes, if for example, if you, you wanted to model a complex between protein A and B, but the complex in the PDB was already known for protein A prime that was linked to, that was homolog to protein A or protein B prime that was homolog to protein B, you could actually build your complex based on the actual complex of the homolog in the PDB. So the interfaces are sometimes, sometimes kept the same, but sometimes they change a little bit. So this is an, an additional uh, difficulty of trying to model the templates, model complexes based on these uh, templates. And finally, you know, docking has been integrated into a larger, you know, a larger uh, effort. You know, for example, what you call today integrative modeling and that's mainly for very large protein assemblies where you use different types of data to drive, you know, to optimize the model. You use docking, you use, uh, you know, actually you, you, you build, you, 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 you use homologs, uh, uh, templates from the PDB to build the, the or, or known structures to build the, uh, the individual components. You have uh, maybe electron density map for the entire complex and you assemble it into electron density map. You have even use proteomics data, protein, protein interaction data from, from, from networks uh, uh, identified in, in the cell. And uh, then you use docking, scoring and optimizing and fitting to get you know, a number of solutions that could be a reasonable model for what you want you know, to achieve. So this is where, you know, more or less we are today and uh, a very important role in, uh, in developing, in fostering these, these developments, in fostering this progress was played by Capri. And Capri is a community-wide uh, initiative. It's called the Critical Assessment of Predicted Interactions. And uh, uh, it's a double blind experiment. It's modeled after CASP and you may have heard and, and know about CASP. And it was launched in 2001, nearly 20 years ago. And it was aimed at assessing the performance of protein docking and scoring algorithms in a completely blind fashion. 
So it was about predicting the structure of unpublished protein, protein, protein DNA, RNA, protein peptide complexes. And in later years, it was extended to the prediction of binding affinities and interface water positions. And this is the CAPRI Management Committee today, and it was run before by, by Joel Jana. And I kind of took over together with uh, Mark Lenzing the, uh, uh, this initiative until now. Now, we launched prediction rounds, you know, on a rolling basis. Typically, the number of predictor groups is about 30 or 40 per round. We have a prediction round with a certain number of targets, and it starts and it finishes at a certain well-defined time. And uh, uh, so this is about 40, 30 to 40 uh, groups uh, participate. So far, you know, uh, there are also uh, we have docking servers. In other words, not only human predictor groups, but also docking servers or, or assembly prediction servers are, uh, have, have been developed, and I mentioned them in, in a while. And the number of rounds so far are 50. It's about four weeks per round. So, you, you know, you have the rounds last for a whole year. And the number of targets to date have been about uh, 180, and it's, it's continuing. So the docking experiments are as follows. The crystallographers that we have to, you know, that, that are generous, uh, de very generously submitting to Capri the atomic coordinates for target complex before publication. And uh, 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 then the predictors are provided with the sequences of the protein subunits and they are asked to return about 100 models for the complex and they rank only five models and that's a detail but i'll, I'll kind of mention why in, in a moment and the assessors the the predicted models are evaluated by assessors and and it's mainly mark lensing and myself but in principle it could be someone else as well and uh, they are given the three-dimensional structure of the target and those of the predicted models. And we establish the correspondence between the model and the target using a quality assessment criteria that have been, uh, have been accepted widely, wide, very widely by the community. And the identity of the predictors are withheld from the assessors, so uh, the performance is ranked on the basis of the best models. Now, the scoring experiment, we introduced also the scoring experiment, in other words, an experiment that just checks, just validates the scoring functions that people evaluate. And uh, uh, this is why we need 100 models. We predictors evaluate, just submit 100 models, and we provide these models from all the predictors for each target as a way, as like 3,000 models per target on average, which we shuffle and then we provide it for the scoring experiment. And the scorers need to uh, uh, really identify the correct models from all the decoys that have been generated during the experiment by all the predictors. Now, we also collaborated with CASP main, during several seasons. So in CASP, you also have a category for predicting assemblies. So we had in 2014, we had 25 targets. And, you know, the last Capri experiment, we had 18 targets and we are just evaluating those. So we also collaborate with Capri because there we have, we want to bring the two communities together because CASP is mainly focusing on predicting the three-dimensional structure of proteins. And we think that this three-dimensional prediction of, of protein structure and the interface and the assembly prediction need to be integrated further. So we had many nice meetings, you know, Capri, over the years in all these nice places. The last meeting was with the EBI. And uh, we also had a whole bunch of different targets. And this, for, for example, you see here, the receptor protein is, is shown here. And then you see the, the, the green and, and the purple are the models of the ligand protein. One is the target, the other one is the predicted model. And sometimes they match, sometimes they don't. And many, may, depending on the difficulty of the target, the match is good and, and, and sometimes the match is much, much less good. And what you see on the, on the, on the, on the panel of the later targets, you see the, the receptor molecule is shown here. And then you see little, little dots, which are the center of mass 
of the lingens that people in the models that people have docked to and the, the, the actual model, the actual target uh, docking center of mass of the, of the lingon is here. And you see there are many wrong models that are being produced. And this is what we analyze. We have also nice stories where, you know, predictions has worked very well. For example, with the, this complex of the core of the nucleosome core particle with the PCR1, you know, ligand, and uh, the predictions were actually extremely good. In other cases where we had interactions between two proteins where the conformational changes are large, and that, you know, didn't, the, the predicted models were not very nice, or not very correct. So, Docking nowadays is really, uh, uh, really more like protein assembly prediction. The docking has moved to be more assembly prediction than docking, than actual docking. And it has become a very active field of research and many new groups are entering you know, the field. The performance has remained quite robust despite increasing targets complexity and the scoring functions have improved. And we also have much improved performance of automatic servers and uh, many that fosters the wider use of assembly modeling tools by the scientific community. And five, 15 servers are currently active. Some perform as well as manual predictors. This is just a quick example of we have, uh, you know, a, a few targets on, on, the, on the X axis that we were run in the CASP 13 Capri prediction performance we have easy targets on the left-hand side and difficult targets on the, on the right-hand side. And you have on the, on the uh, uh, horizontal axis, you have a, a score which is called doc Q. And the better the models, the higher the score. And actually you see on the, on the right-hand side, high quality models. So, so for, for each target, each column is a target and for high quality models, the models are, are, are really red and they have a high a doc skew score and a doc Q score and the medium, medium quality models are green uh, and acceptable models are blue. And you see for the easy targets, you have many good models that are being submitted. For the difficult targets, which are often multi-protein complexes, where you have to predict not only one interface correctly, but many other interfaces, several other interfaces. Unfortunately, often it turns out that the models predict correctly one of the interfaces, the largest interface, and fail to predict the others. And uh, uh, then uh, we also did interface predictions, in other words, predicting not uh, uh, really the contacts between residues at the interface between, you know, two, two proteins, but just which residues are part of the interface. We also did that, but we did use, we, we used as a prediction tool, we used the docking solutions. And uh, we could, we, we did a whole analysis of how docking is able to predict interfaces what, what residues of a given protein are part of an interface without really predicting contacts. And that was, you know, a, an interesting analysis. And we showed that docking algorithms can do a prediction of residues on the interface, which is much better than if you do it just simply based on sequence and other, other methods. We also, uh, Capri also tested the ability to predict interface water molecules because in some, in some, protein, in some protein interfaces are wet and they have really positions of water molecules which are conserved and, and well, you know, well, well bonded to other protein atoms. So we, we asked the community to predict such positions and the results were not, not, not bad at all. And for example, we had an, another case, we also uh, had complexes of protein with peptides. And uh, here is an example of a very nice uh, a prediction where the predicted peptide is really overlapping extremely well with the peptide in the target. Shows that even for flexible, you know, segments of, the, of, of fle flexible peptides, the predictions can be uh, reasonably good. So just uh, very, very quickly, just to show the variety in, 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 in approaches, the generation of models in terms of individual models of individual subunits, you can use homology modeling, there are public servers that you can use. Then you can use also template-based modeling used increasingly for homo oligomers. 
that's what I was talking about before when you use a template for the entire complex. And this is, this is more available for homo oligomers for, for, for complexes with, where they have exactly the same subunits that interact with each other. And uh, so these, also a whole bunch of methods are being used here. And uh, in ab initio docking, when you use just, just real docking, you have very fast rigid body sampling uh, followed by refinement with confirmation of flexibility. You have also data-driven docking, so integrating functional, biochemical, biophysical information. So a variety of methods here too. And then you have a whole panoply of scoring functions, shape complementarity, uh, geometric, geometric matching, contact pair potentials, whatever. And you don't see some, you know, you don't see differences in terms of performance between, not, not big differences at least, between these different approaches. So methods were also adapted to handle diverse type of complexes such as protein peptide, protein RNA and DNA, and protein oligo, uh, oligosaccharides as well. So if you are interested to learn more about all these tools and, and, and databases and, and, and data, benchmark data set that have been generated to help, do, to help docking, to help uh, uh, assembly modeling, you can go to capri.docking.org and there is a panoply of tools and panoply of resources. There's also docking servers and specialized docking servers and uh, uh, a number of other important things in, in the community and all this has been, has been uh, contributed by the Capri community. And this is just the beginning. Now, uh, I'm nearly nearing the end and, and you know, one has to say modeling protein assemblies, you know, are we done, you know, how, how what, what, is, what, what needs to be done in the future? Well, understanding is still uh, lacking and ability is also lacking. So what, what, is, what are the main remaining problems? It's poor estimation of binding free energy, force field scoring function, conformational sampling. All these are problems. The, the force fields are not, you know, not, not exactly what we want, want them to be. Uh, the conformational sampling neither. And what we really lack is reliable structure affinity data benchmarks. You know, we need these really benchmarks of having right, you know, structures, structures of complexes and the actual measured affinities to be able to improve the uh, de derivation of, of scoring functions. Now we have also very limited ability to discriminate binders from non-binders and actually evaluating the specificity of interaction is still a problem. Now, a major problem, the last major problem, but not the least one, is we cannot still model conformational changes very well, or, or some of, in some cases, not at all, will fail completely. And this is an important challenge that we are taking now in the future taking on in the future. But data-driven models, you know, uh, or data-driven procedures where can partially overcome these limitations and these procedures are by, of integrating experimental restraints, biochemical information and co-evolution co analysis. This helps to overcome some of these problems. And in the future, we need to expand the horizons of 3D modeling and assembly modeling and uh, uh, we need to consider the system, not just the building blocks. In other words, better integration of three-dimensional structure in assembly modeling. And we need to integrate the dynamic components, better modeling of local global conformational flexibility and uh, uh, using computational and bioinformatic tools, not only computation, but actually use the information from protein structures to try to try kind of build a landscape of, of protein, protein conformational landscape. So here is, I'm ending now, and many thanks to folks involved in the Capri operation, and these are, these are really very key people, you know, Samir Velankar and, 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 and Nurul Nazardin from the EBI, our Capri, they, they, follow, they, they are responsible for the Capri operation on the website, Mark Lenzing is a huge uh, help in uh, uh, an important person in assessing the predictions. And uh, uh, the other people here, Kim and, and Rafael and Raul have, 
helped a lot in, in, in all kinds of aspects you know, in, in, in the past. And Gerard Kleiwek also participated you know, before uh, Samir kind of came into the picture. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Shoshana, for your talk, your amazing, amazing talk. Uh, there are many questions, but we left a very little time. Are you there? Are you hearing me? Do you yes. hear me? I cannot see you. Okay. So I'll make you a few questions from the people. And later, if you want to stay at the Zoom, you can answer by writing in the Q&A section of the sure, Zoom. Sure, yeah. Yeah. But if not, they will have to email you and ask you. I'm sorry, I was a bit long. <laughs> no, don't worry. Uh, so uh, there are some questions about your life and another about science. Uh, Erika Sousa says, uh, how was your early days in the lab? If, if you were able, if you were included in the discussions in the lab? Yeah, I must say that in the US, you know, yes, I was included in the discussions. And if I, if I was, you know, not included, I, I did force myself into them. <laughs> <laughs> nicely, nicely, not badly, nicely. I tried to. <laughs> That's nice to know. So another question say that uh, from Alexander, uh, that now is well known the rule of intrinsic disorder proteins in protein-protein interactions and how docking, docking methods are dealing with it? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. Not well, but you know, we're really in the beginning of, of, of trying to model these intrinsically disordered ensembles. And that's something that we need to, you know, we, we need to integrate. So we, right now, this is really, in, and anything that has to do with flexibility is not, not well taken care of. Okay. That's a quick answer. <laughs> that's okay. And well, many people say that it was a great talk. Thank you very much. Many, many, many comments saying that. <laughs> okay, and, good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you always have to, to have to do whatever you like to do and not to be discouraged. And, you know, women has, have just as much, you know, to say than any, anyone else, you know, in the field. So just, just go ahead and do your thing. That is a, this is a nice message. Another question from Maria Rosa Morales. Uh, she says that uh, if you know that Latin American uh, colleagues are collaborating in Capri, and if not, uh, if you have any opinion about the development of, of this uh, science in Latin America. I really don't know. And it's terrible of my side because, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I think we had some contact with some people from Latin America, but that was a while ago. So I have to look back in, on, on the list of, of participants and see. Mm. We have participants from the whole world. I didn't show the map. Like I didn't, you know, didn't, didn't show that. I don't have the data right now. But, you know, we have from Japan, from, from everywhere in Europe, from everywhere in the U.S., many, many places in the U.S. I'm sure there must have someone, you know, from, from, from Latin America. I'll find out. <laughs> but bad on my side. <laughs> I'll find out. Another um, question say uh, that if the accuracy of the an annotation process can somehow impact on protein-protein analysis pro process? That is coming from Alan Adonai, this, this question. I, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the accuracy of annotation is really, really important. But, you know, I don't know of what, he, what was really meant in that, you know, in this question, what aspect of the accuracy, you know, if it's the go, you know, wrong go annotation, who cares? Because we are looking at sequences, we are trying to look at homologs based on sequence alignment. But you know, sometimes what is a problem may be a problem of, of, of very distant protein. If proteins are distantly related and they come, they are you know put in the wrong PFAM category, that is something that could could affect. So yes, it may affect in in, in some cases. So, and, um, thank you. Another question is, what about uh, having residues with uh, post-translational modifications and glycosylation? Um, uh, yeah, 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 there is yeah, any yeah. advance in the field? Yeah, yeah, that's a big problem. <laughs> Very good questions. Nothing happens. We don't know what, you know, 
we actually don't take that into account and that's really bad. But, you know, we, we actually, the crystal structures have very little, you know, uh, data or really limited data. Only now that we have, you know, cryo-M, you know, really high resolution cryo-M, cryo-EM, that, for example, for the, for the, for this, for the SARS uh, spike protein, fantastic, you know, you have, you have these, <laughs> these decorations everywhere and they play yeah, a huge role. Yeah, like, I mean, give us a field. Give us a field. You have to introduce this and to see how. But it's heterogeneous, so it's really hard to model. Really, really hard to model. Very good yeah. question. And I also would like to say, how far are we to to predict which protein will interact with each other with another one? Um, I know there are some results. It's it's very hard to see because you see, yeah, I mean, this is a, if two proteins will interact or not. Is this the question, yes. more or less? You know, if you have two proteins, they say, you know, will they interact or will they not yes. interact? Yes, that's the question. Well, sometimes I think it could be possible if there is no interface that really, you know, seems to be of a reasonable size because given a mass for the two, each of the proteins, you can more or less see what kind of interface you would need for them to be stable. Now, we have cases where, you know, the protein, you, 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 you are looking at structures which are two domains from mm -hmm. a protein that forms a dimer. And you look at the structure of the two domains and you see that they're really interacting a lot. But the dimer is actually forming from the part that you don't have the structure from. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it, I think in general, it's not a solved problem at all. Mm. So we can get the scoring functions, give you the best scoring function that you get from what you analyze, but you don't know, you don't know what the rest, what, what can happen. And yeah. also if you have this, the concentration plays a huge role. If you use higher concentration, you can still get a stable complex, even if in lower concentration it will not form. This is a big problem. <laughs> So thank you very much, Shoshana. There are many other questions. Um, I hope that, I, I think they will have to write you or find you somewhere. So how, how, can I get, how can I get this question? They can write to me with, you know, with pleasure, I'll answer. Okay. If someone can put these questions together, I'll try to answer. And that's nice. And okay. we, we can do that and, show. And, and thank you again for inviting me. It's a big pleasure. Thank you very much. To you for being here. It's an honor and a pleasure to, to hear such a nice talk with all the story of these protein structures and binding. <laughs> okay. You Thank, you. This, this story. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank Good you. luck with the rest of the conference. I'll I <laughs> try from time to time to hear because I'm really I'm really curious. Okay. Okay.